All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome to our last uh, CMFI MassPEC uh, seminar in this semester before the spring break. Um, it's my, my great pleasure to have uh, Max Saito today giving the lecture. He's an expert in uh, metaproteomics. So obviously that's gonna be uh, then also today's topic to give you a very brief uh, introduction about uh, uh, Max. So he uh, did uh, um, his bachelor in biology and environmental studies with a minor in chemistry at the uh, Oberlin College. And then uh, uh, did a PhD at the uh, MIT Woods Hole Joint Program in Chemical Oceanography. Uh, and then after um, a postdoc at, at Princeton, he uh, went back to, to Woods Hole, where he's a uh, um, yeah, uh, senior scientist now with, with tenure. And yeah, I think he has done some quite uh, uh, fundamental work in the, in the field of like uh, metaproteomics, particularly in, in, in ocean systems. And yeah, I think that's going to be uh, the topic of today's lecture, and I'm very much looking forward to it. So floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Daniel. And it's really a pleasure to be here um, giving this lecture. So yeah, as you, as you heard, I'm, I'm primarily an ocean scientist, but we do a lot of analytical chemistry. We're kind of a combination of analytical chemistry, microbiology group. And so we really enjoy pushing the limits of what mass spectrometry and proteomics can do. Um, and uh, there's some unique aspects that, that we have to pay attention to because um, uh, our samples are uh, more are very complex, and so I'll touch on that today. I, I looked over your syllabus; looks like you had a lot of great um, um, build up to this point in proteomics and mass spectrometry. Um, so hopefully, I'll, I'll do a very brief amount of re review, but also um, sort of then dive into what's unique about um, ocean beta proteomics, uh, and also touch briefly on metalloproteomics, which is sort of a, a new area we've been working on uh, extensively as well. But just for background, as you know, um, proteins are a major component of, of organisms. They're roughly 50% of cellular biomass, and they have really uh, some really fundamental roles in organisms. They can be enzymes that undertake uh, are key in metabolism, and, and through that, they're important in biogeochemistry and biogeochemical cycling, and that's why uh, we're interested in, in the environment as well. Um, they have important structural roles, such as carboxysomes and capsids, and they're involved in regulatory systems and transport of ions and substrates. Um, and so so being able to measure them directly is really powerful um, in terms of understanding the function of organisms in the environment. And um, it's important to also distinguish them from um, um, DNA and RNA. You know, microbial ecology, which is, is a really key field in environmental sciences, um, has really focused on these other molecules. Um, but proteins are really different. I mean, DNA and RNA are really information molecules, and they're not directly involved in reactions. Um, but nevertheless, proteins are still a polymer. Um, so um, that actually makes them really amenable to automated informatic techniques and high throughput analyses. So it's sort of a, it's an interesting sort of sweet spot um, um, of, of analysis. Um, and um, the field has been growing quite rapidly over recent years. Um, it really basically got started around 2005 and 2006. There was a, this key paper that came out of Jill Banfield and Bob Hedick's group um, looking at uh, proteomics in a natural biofilm and acid mine drainage. Um, and then um, Paul Wilms uh, coined the phrase metaproteomics in the literature um, with this 2006 paper as well. Since then, um, there's been a number of studies in a, in a number of complex communities. Uh, basically, you know, metaproteomics, just to define it, is, is the analysis of many organisms together simultaneously, right? And um, uh, that adds complexity because you simply have many proteomes that are mixed. Um, and so those can be inside guts of animals or humans. Um, they can be in the ocean or terrestrial environments or in sediments. And, um, and they can be in wastewater analyses too, which has become a really important public health aspect of metaproteomics recently. Um, there's a new society that's been doing annual meetings. Um, uh, it's largely based in Europe. Um, here's the picture from last year's meeting that I was fortunate to attend. Um, and so if you're interested in that, you, I would recommend checking out their website. Uh, and there's also been some um, um, intercomparison projects that are ongoing, one by the Metaproteomic Initiative and another from our Ocean Metaproteomic community. And those have been coming out and they look really, um, really encouraging in terms of reproducibility in the community despite sample complexity. Um, and I also wanted to just bring people's attention to um, uh, a global international effort to study um, the metabolism and nutrient cycles in the oceans. And, and this is sort of inspired by um, a program which is sort of winding down and finishing up called Geotraces that went out and measured the micronutrients throughout the world's oceans. Uh, this is a 3D image of the Atlantic Basin shown here, and you can see all 
all the different places where iron is coming in and out, including the hypothermal vent uh, plumes in the central um, mid-Atlantic Ridge. Um, the idea is to take that new capability that was developed in terms of measuring micronutrients and combine it with all these new omic technologies that are coming out, as well as other biogeochemical rate measurements and, and, and laboratory and coastal studies, and combine that to try and improve um, ocean understanding uh, and ecosystem understanding and our influence on them. So um, it's it's just getting organized. So if you hadn't heard of it yet and you have any interest in this, I encourage you to go to this website and, and sign up for our mailing list. Uh, it's a pretty low traffic mailing list right now, but there'll be some um, really exciting um, early career exchanges that will be um, have uh, opportunities for funding and applications. So um, definitely uh, would like to encourage this community to, to sign up and be aware of that and take advantage of it. Um, so um, getting back to metapardiomics, there's, there's a number of challenges that we face in trying to uh, analyze metapardiomics. And, and um, at a workshop of ocean and metapardiomics scientists a few years ago, we put together this list where we face challenges from sample collection, you know, where getting to the environment is complicated and, and our samples, our organisms can be very dilute. Um, the diversity can be really tremendous, thousands of organisms. And and um, and then with there's a lot of sort of operational challenges of what do we use for filtration and things like that. Um, and then the analysis, of course, has a lot of complexity um, using LCMS, high resolution LCMS. And and there's a there's a large dynamic range in in, in um, analytes because some of the organisms can be very very scarce, uh, and then there's tremendous sample complexity, um, and um, and then there's a, a ton of informatic questions. Um, uh, you know, how do we go about analyzing these complex samples? Do tools that were developed for model organisms and human and yeast do they work well for metaproteomics and things like that? Um, and that's something that the community is, has been uh, exploring. Um, and then and basic questions like, how do you call a protein in a mixture of, of many peptides simultaneously? That's actually a really, a really complex question in metaproteomics. Um, uh, and then finally, how do we disseminate this complex data type to the to a broad audience and get, get the community excited about it uh, and using this data too? Um, and so um, it's also, um, as we think about these analyses, it's interesting to reflect again on how um, proteins are different than RNA and DNA. And one thing I always like to point out is that um, that there's a lot of chemically diverse uh, capabilities conferred by amino acids that we don't get from um, uh, nucleic acids, right? And I think I think people often forget that, but um, you know the amino acids are chemically different from each other, um, you know, um, as we well know, and that confers the properties that the proteins need for um, whatever capability they've evolved to to do. But that allows us to actually separate them chromatographically. And that's something that that is not really possible with DNA and RNA with the four base pairs. They're actually very chemically similar um, and they're non-reactive on purpose um, so that because they're information molecules. But because because these have chemistry, we can actually use a lot of chromatography. And, and so that's a fundamental difference in how um, we approach separation of these molecules where uh, a lot of shotgun genomics and transcriptomics is just brute force sampling. Um, because because you can't really separate the samples much more than shearing the DNA, um, whereas um, or, or you know various selection techniques like poly A um, um, selection for eukaryotes and things like that. Whereas for proteomics, we can do a lot of um, ch chromatography, um, and um, and also um, the proteins are also important in biogeochemical cycles because they often contains a lot of metals, and this is something that I think. Um, uh, is really kind of amazing when you get your head around it. Um, there are some estimates that a third of all enzymes require metal for functionality. Um, um, I should caveat this. Sometimes people use proteins instead of enzymes. Um, it's probably uh, restricted to enzymes um, um, or some proteins like zinc finger structural molecules. But you know that's largely based on genomic analyses, trying to get functional analysis of, of binding sites of metals. But it, it, whatever the number is, it's clear that there's a, a very large number of uh, proteins that require metal. Um, the nitrogen cycle, every single enzyme in the nitrogen cycle requires uh, a metal uh, functioning. Many um, key reactions in photosynthesis also require metals. So, so this there's this um, connection between inorganic chemistry and organic chemistry that's that's really important to bridge um, and metalloproteomics and um, metals are, are, and proteins are really right at the center of all that, which is really exciting. Um, and so we use proteomics to d dig into um, uh, microbial biogeochemistry and um, the workflow is, is straightforward. We collect biomass, we, we analyze filtered um, biomass so we get a lot of cells 
Uh, we typically try and use 0.2 micron filters to get everything or or different sizes like a three micron to get more eukaryotes. Um, and then we do our separation by HPLC and our measure of peptide masses and fragment or ions um, and um, reconstruct our, uh, our proteomes um, using metagenome information, actually. That's really key. And um, um, you can use model organism information, but because the reconstruction requires exact matches to um, uh, nucleic acid sequences, um, the metagenomes make a huge difference in, in identification. And um, we've explored how complex ocean samples are. And we actually had some really interesting um, conversation with mass spec vendors over the years where they were, we sent them um, samples or spectra and they were just shocked at how complex our, our spectra were, um, which was really, uh, really interesting. They, they, you know, I think a lot of people in the biomedical community assume, you know, human may be sort of the pinnacle of complexity um, from our anthropomorphic perspective, but um, then you show them an ocean spectra and they're humbled. Um, and you can see that right here. This is a, a chromatogram over 200 minutes. Um, if we just isolate uh, a single scan event um, at minute 68 um, from the mass range 400 to 1600, um, um, actually blown up here. Um, and uh, this is one scan of the 70,000 scan scans of the run. And then we're just gonna blow up this 500 to 502 mass range here. So just a tiny slice of one mass spectra out of 70,000 mass spectra. So zooming in super deep. Um, on, on one sample, um, and uh, we can compare HeLa, human cell line, from this 500 to 502 um, blow up window range, and we just pick that arbitrarily, and then you can compare that to an ocean range here, and, and you can see there's, you know, there's maybe 10 peaks or so in the human cell line, um, but there's just many more peaks here and um, um, that exist in the ocean, maybe four times more, and um, often you can see them sort of digging into the noise here, and, and these aren't isotopic distribution patterns, these are unique peptides um, in most cases, right? And, and if you think about the way most algorithms approach this, they'll sort of skim off the top 10 most peptides and then move on, right, in, in a global um, data-dependent acquisition mode. And then, but you're left with all these tiny precursors down here that a lot of them don't have charge states. So um, a lot of them are just going to be missed over and over and over again, right? And so we have this challenge of how do we get at those rare peptides that are just filling up our sample spectra? Um, and so uh, we've approached this in a couple ways, and um, I should preface this that we're we're sort of a um, we do a lot of uh, complex chromatography in our lab, and um, um, and to be honest, not that many people um, have um, are willing or have the resources to spend the time to to develop similarly complex chromatography. Um, but we found that it really helps um, our analyses. So um, we do global discovery metaproteomics, and this is. Um, you know, deep proteomes, and I'll talk about this more in a minute. And, and this is relative abundance scales, though. So spectral counts is our main unit. And then we also do what's known as targeted metaproteomics. Um, and um, this can involve calibration with stable isotope labeled peptides and also have um, is capable of stoichiometry, which is actually really exciting. Once you calibrate, you have absolute numbers, femtomoles, copy number. Um, and um, and this can be done with multiple reaction monitoring and or PRM, and I'll, I'll mention those again briefly. And this is a 3D view of some some of our uh, one of our samples actually a single injection. I'll, I'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, but just to review uh, various methods, um, so in global global proteomics, we tend to have um, two main avenues: data dependent acquisition, which basically um, um, you know, does a full scan like I showed before and then picks, you know, the N largest peaks shown here. There are five of the biggest peaks. And then those are selected for fragmentation and then um, in narrow windows. And that generates spectra that then you can say, OK, well, the each of these spectra then um, could represent a peptide. And then the, um, a peptide does a spectrum matching algorithm will then identify the peptide in there, comparing it to a genome. Um, very recent in the recent years, um, data independent acquisition has gotten very popular. Where instead of picking the five biggest peaks, you pick um, consists of mass ranges, and then you then fragment everything in there. So each spectra is a combination of peptides, um, and so this is very exciting. Um, it's a way to not miss any peptides in theory, but then each of your subsequent spectra is is more complex. Uh, and I, I know you had a, a lecture about that recently, but I just wanted to bring it here for completeness. So targeted proteomics um, then can take a different angle where um, originally this were done on triple quadrupoles or quadrupole instruments where you had single reaction monitoring in this case, SRM or multiple reaction monitoring, where the first quadrupole only lets one ion through and then, and then um, um, adds a collision energy and then um, selects three masses for fragment ions and then quanti 
quants each of those three, right? So a very streamlined workflow where you've got a list of targets and a list of um, of um, ions that result from um, fragmentation, and then the machine is just scanning those over and over again very rapidly. Um, in recent years, orbit traps have gotten into the, the absolute quant game by parallel reaction monitoring, where the first two aspects are the same, but then um, you can scan the whole mass range um, in the orbit trap for the, for the fragment ions, and, um, and then you can quant them there. And so this is a really exciting sort of hybrid approach between um, you know, um, sort of uh, um, combining uh, the Arby trap with now the targeted methods um, and still can achieve a lot of sensitivity. And then of course, in theory, DIA can start moving into the targeted and, and absolute quant round two if you add um, calibration standards, right? Um, um, basically, and that's sort of the exciting part about DIA, could it eventually sort of bridge the gaps between global and targeted proteomics? And in theory, we could start quanting many, many things, if not everything. Uh, the challenge then really becomes calibration. And I should, and also speed. Really, instrument speed is the key for decreasing these isolation windows. Which um, I won't talk about that today. But we've been exploring DIA for metaproteomics, and 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 um, that's really one of the key parameters. Um, um, and we're hoping for faster instruments all the time um, to help us with our complex samples. So, um, in terms of two D approaches. Um, um, we have developed a, uh, a method that is capable of um, spreading out the sample over eight hours, but maintaining really narrow peak widths. And so that's really important because, you know, some of those small peaks that we want, if we spread out the peaks by just running an eight hour gradient, they'll get too small and we won't be able to get enough ions into the mass spec to, to measure them. And so we have a fully automated nano flow uh, two dimensional um, active modulation reverse phase liquid chromatography setup that basically is shown here um, uh, where we have uh, one dimension with this black line here and then a second dimension that's basically like 14 um, shorter runs that's taking the illusion from the first dimension right and it's got it does that through using traps and switching valves um, and it's basically switching between high pH and low pH um, on a C18 gradient and um, the net effect is in 1D, you can see this axis is basically your peak width, right? And so, and then the vertical axis is your peak intensity. And so um, in 1D, you're getting wider peak widths at lower intensity, right? But by in this 2D mode, you're getting nice tight peak widths, you know, roughly, you know, 10 second peak widths, but you're, and you're maintaining the signal intensity. So you get that packet of ions into the machine and you get the chance to fragment it and you get really nice um, uh, fragmentation spectra here. This is sort of a PRM mode shown over here of three fragment ions from a peptide. And so this makes a big difference, uh, it turns out. So um, here's HeLa, human cell line shown here in, in 1D and, and 2D. If we do uh, 1D over eight hours, just spreading out the human cell sample over eight hours, and then this active modulation 2D approach, basically you don't get a lot of difference, right? We're sort of maxing out the complexity of human sample um, in our 1D run. You get a little bit of improvement. But in our ocean samples, because we have so many of those small peaks, we're getting a huge increase, like almost a 50% increase in some of these samples of protein IDs, right? And so, so for us, we've we've moved to this as being sort of our dominant um, uh, global discovery method. And uh, since it's fully automated, we can just load up the machine and it's running on eight hour runs, three samples a day and churning through samples. Um, kind of an expensive way to run um, if everything has to be an eight hour run, but, but um, Given the limitations of instrument speed at this point, it's we found it's currently our, our best, our sort of our gold standard of, of proteome depth, uh, meta proteome depth. And so we've applied this to ocean samples. Here's an example um, from uh, Jackie Saunders uh, PhD, I'm sorry, postdoc work when she was here. She's now um, a professor at University of Georgia. And um, this is a, a cruise we had um, from Hawaii to uh, Tahiti in the Central Pacific Ocean um, covering 5,000 kilometers um, of distance, going down 1,000 1, meters into the ocean, so a kilometer into the ocean, roughly. Uh, about 100 um, metaproteomic samples, so um, large volume filtration, probably about you know, um, 200 to 300 liters per sample, and we use a quarter of those um, for our analysis. And it's this, this is the, um, the bacterial and archaeal fraction, um, largely shown here. And um, um, the, the environments were... Um, organized by different depths, basically a surface, cline, deep, and twilight, twilight and deep depths um, by k-means clustering to generate this across. And you can see they, they changed um, as you moved across the, the environment with depth um, based, based on light penetration and, and ecosystem um, parameters. And so we measured total protein in all these and 
Um, the total protein drops really quickly as you go into the deep ocean because there's light in the upper ocean, so you have a lot of photosynthetic organisms. Um, uh, but you still have some biomass down deep there. Um, and um, uh, we have some reproducibility in our BCAA total protein assay. This actually is probably one of the, the, the hardest things we found to, to just get reproducibility is our total protein assay. And we've looked at various aspects of how to improve that. Uh, but it's sort of a key parameter because it's the denominator in a lot of our samples, you know, total, uh, you know, proteins per total protein of a sample. Um, and um, when you do this kind of analysis, you can then look at the different kinds of enzymes present and the different functional groups. And so these are the keg ontology groups, and there's roughly about 2,000 um, enzyme functions um, in this data set. Um, and in terms of the cumulative percentage of um, spectral counts, a small number of, of enzymes really dominate in abundance, but this is very long tail of rare enzymes that um, is, are doing you know, metabolic functions and, and likely biogeochemical functions as well. And then you can look at them in terms of their enzyme commission classes, and you can see that they, they um, that you see differences with depth, whereas in the surface, you see sort of a more even distribution, in particular with more transferases. And then as you go down into the deep water column, these oxyreductases become really important. And, and that's really a transition from the surface where we have growth and reproduction um, to down deep where we have um, obtaining energy with oxyreductases, because these are chemolithotrophic organisms that are doing uh, redox reactions to, to live off of. Um, and there's a ton of data in this. We have 100 samples and um, uh, roughly uh, 88,000 proteins were identified, mapping to metagenomic data, um, and roughly 2,000 keg ontology groups. Um, that basically produces, you know, 88,000 full depth, or not full depth, uh, 1,000 meter uh, ocean sections, as you saw here. Every one of these images flashing by is a, a identified protein or a protein group in our sense. And and and, um, and you can see if you, you know, uh, it's more than you can take in, obviously. Um, but you can see there's distinct patterns. There's organisms that live down deep and organisms that live in the aquatic column that are synthetic and ones that are in the middle. Uh, and so you can start wondering, you know, who's there and what they're doing with each of these enzymes. Um, and so many, many stories that can be dug into with this data set. Um, each one of these sections is potentially a story. Um, and here's some of those sections now sort of um, highlighted where, um, you know, you can see important enzymes such as um, these are nitrogen transformation enzymes, nitrate oxidase reductase and ammonia oxi oxygenase, um, sulfur proteins, dislimitary um, sulfate reductase, um, and so on um, at various depths. And they can be sort of they can be mapped to these different curves that I showed you in the total protein abundance. Um, so different enzymes at different depths, um, basically helping to keep um, these various ocean ecosystems operating. Um, and uh, these strategies can also be applied to eukaryotic organisms to larger size fractions. And this was some of the postdoc work of Natalie Cohen, where um, uh, she analyzed the data set from the Central Pacific again. Um, and uh, in the upper water column, we found a ton of proteins that were mapping to dinoflagellates. And this was exciting because dinoflagellates are, are um, extraordinarily complex organisms. Their genomes are larger than the human genome. Um, they carry a lot of you know, extra stuff in their genome, we think. Um, they're mixotrophic, so they can do photosynthesis or heterotrophy or both at the same time. Um, there's not much known about them because they're hard to culture and their genomes are hard to sequence because they're so big, right? But they're important in the environment and they just showed up all over our, um, of this data set. And that was shown in, in the pigment analyses. Um, as well as in both, you know, um, you know, uh, 18S transcripts and protein data sets. Uh, you can see in purple here is the dinoflagellates. You can just see they're really abundant, um, mixed in with a variety of other organisms. Um, and it's interesting to reflect on, on how these different categories um, are different too um, and what they're capturing and why they may be different. Um, so I want to switch to uh, targeted um, metaproteomics. And this is a technique now where um, we can go in and measure um, specific biomarkers. You know, in this case, this was done with MRMs, multiple reaction monitoring, and they were ca um, calibrated to copy number femtomoles per liter of seawater. And we were able to go across this part of the Pacific Ocean and, and identify regions where there was nitrogen stress and then iron stress in the south, um, going from north to south. And that mapped very nicely where there was an upwelling of nitrogen. So once nitrogen was upwelled, the system basically switched to iron stress and there's less iron addition, iron input from the atmosphere in the southern hemisphere as well. So the iron stress continued in the southern hemisphere. And these are the, the, the vertical profiles that then made these color map 
um, sections, as we call them. And the organism that we're mapping to is, is a cytobacteria named Procarcoccus, and this gray line is its pigment. So it was present throughout this region. And you can just see how, how, how clean the data were. We were really pleased with that. Um, and um, I think there's a, a sort of an exciting potential to use RNA or protein to detect environmental stress um, using these biomarkers. Um, and there's a number of proteins or, or transcripts that have been identified that then um, are known to turn up significantly when iron, nitrogen, phosphorus, vitamin B12, or zinc or cobalt um, becomes scarce. And so, you know, can we make a suite of targeted molecules that we measure uh, and then really diagnose um, what the major taxa, uh, in this case, photosynthetic organisms are feeling in the oceans? Um, and it's it's this is actually exactly analogous to cancer biomarkers. Um, and just we're applying it to the ocean space using um, really the same technology. Um, and so um, here's an example of this where we saw one protein that was um, ridiculously abundant um, in the in the global data set. This is shown here. Um, this is the nitrite oxidative reductase enzyme, one of those um, oxidative reductases I mentioned earlier. Um, this is unnormalized um, spectral counts, and you can just see it really dominates. Um, it's in red and blue. Um, these are various, you know, um, uh, uh, um, homologous sequences shown down deep, and in this ocean section version that you can see, it's just it just really dominates um, the spectral counts. So what's happening here? We looked at the proteome of a cultured isolate of this one of the organisms that this enzyme. Um, can be made by. And in its proteome, sure enough, the number one and number two, or really number one, two, and five, four, and fifth most abundant proteins were the subunits of, um, of this enzyme. Um, there were multiple copies. And, um, and uh, this is its structure, and it's known to have an enormous amount of iron in it, 23 atoms of iron. So this connects again to that sort of iron protein, organic, inorganic connection. Um, exciting story that, um, and to us, this was really shocking, like, you know, is to see um, the most abundant protein in the mesopelagic be a metal enzyme um, uh, when so much of the oceans are known to be iron limited um, was really shocking to us. And it made us wonder if this is perhaps one of the most abundant metalloenzymes on earth. And we just had no idea until we did these analyses. And so um, other groups had done some really elegant mic uh, microbiology and microscopy on this and found that um, this organism and, and these nitrifying organisms, not the exact organism, but um, other nitrifying organisms, basically coat their membrane in this enzyme to the extent that you can see a lattice structure from it. Um, and so we think this organism is just covering their membranes with this enzyme so that any sinking um, nitrogen that comes down, they can take advantage of because they need it for energy. And it would take a while to synthesize this enzyme. So um, they don't have time to do that if in sort of a rapid flux event. So so they're they're spending all their resources and all their iron um, in order to basically be ready to wait for that nitrite rain to come down um, into the mesopelagic. And so how do we do this um, targeted method that I, I've just shown a few examples of? Um, um, Hold on, let me just make sure I'm not out of order here. Oh, I, the slide is out of order. Let me jump to this one first. Um, and so um, we can go and um, that we can use. Uh, no, let me let me. I'll stick in order. <laughs> so so um, let me explain how this targeted method works. Um, basically, you want a stable isotope labeled peptide that you inject with your sample, and then you do a calibration against it. Usually, just a one point calibration. Um, um, to get the abundance of your target peptide. Um, you can have them synthesized with N15. Uh, that turns out to be um, an effective way to do it, but it's also kind of costly. Um, and we were making a tremendous number of these peptides. And so we realized that that wasn't su really sustainable from our, you know, on, on government grants. Um, so we shifted to making them ourselves and we use a method that's known as Q-concat, where we basically um, insert peptides into DNA with spacer sequences. Uh, make a plasmid, um, and then ligate that into an overexpression plasmid, and then add, um, 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 give that to E. coli to overexpress, and then harvest the, um, the fusion protein, digest it with, with, with trypsin, and then we generate our peptides. We also include um, um, a sequence in there that allows us to calibrate them, in, in this case, you know, um, a commercial standard of peptides that we've added to our sequence synthesis list. And then because we feed these E. coli N15, all of these peptides are fully loaded with N15. Uh, and we can get some really nice reproducibility. Um, this is just batch to batch reproducibility with a slope that's uh, close to one and R squared that's high, and then a very good sensitivity on, on an individual peptide. So we're able to make them ourselves, 
it's actually um, relatively inexpensive to do. And then you've once you have the plasmid, you have the standards forever. You just have to overexpress them again and make them. It takes a little while to, to validate them, but it's a nice approach. And uh, here's an example of what you see then. Here's um, a peptide that's been measured um, um, and the, the, the natural version and the N15 labeled version. Um, and you can see the masses are just a little bit off because of those N15s. And these are the different fragment ions. Um, I'm sorry, these are the different isotopes um, in this case. And then the fragment ions down here that associate with this. And, and these are the B and the Y ions associated as you go from each end um, and take off amino acids. Um, so it's it, it's a really clean um, technique, targeted approaches. In this case, PRMs um, work really beautifully. And um, here's another example of that where um, just a bunch of peptides we used. Um, here's our supplementary table four. I don't get to show this very often, but since this is more of a technical group, I'm happy to do that. Just wanted to highlight that, you know, you have some relative standard deviations in the single digit percents uh, in most cases. So we get some really nice reproducibility um, for these peptides. Um, so you can then use this information. And one of the things that people often say about omics is you can't get rates from omics. And um, I'd like to put forward that that's not necessarily true. Uh, if you think about the definition uh, um, of specific activity from a biochemistry class, it's basically you know units of activity per microgram of protein. Um, Halus menten kinetics are, are very similar. If you have the kinetic parameters, you can predict the reaction rate. Uh, that's a more nuanced way to do it because it takes into account the substrate concentration, whereas specific activity assumes the substrate is saturating. And so we can take the, our, our data of that really abundant protein I mentioned before, NXR, and here it's been calibrated to femtomoles per liter um, using seven peptides um, and averaging them. And then we can multiply it by the stoichiometry of the iron, and we know how much iron is in that enzyme. Then we can then use the mahalis mahenton kinetics from um, some of our colleagues' nice microbiology studies um, on this enzyme. And uh, if you have those parameters and you do some unit conversions, um, you can then calculate the reaction rate directly. Um, and this, importantly, this relies on um, the substrate concentration of nitrite. And um, in this case, we think this organism is substrate limited. And so um, that's really a key parameter. These We call these potential rates because uh, there's more enzyme than substrate um, to, to work on, and so they're basically, you know, um, substrate limited. And um, but that can be, you know, incorporated in these equations, and these equations could be directly incorporated into models. So, so I think it's a really exciting aspects of of um, proteomics to be able to convert targeted data into rate data. Right, and um, I wanted to just briefly let people know that. Um, there's also another approach that's possible um, that we've been working on called metalloproteomics. Uh, and there's a, a handful of groups working on this around the world. Um, but it's it's very exciting in this in that you if you do a native extraction of the organism, so you don't have detergents, you can then um, um, analyze the metals and the proteins um, from the same molecule. And basically, if you do if you um, isolate in a glove box anaerobically so you don't lose your um, metal um, metal ligation sites, and then you do um, two dimensions of chromatography, all native as well. Um, and then you have a bunch of fractions and then you split them with a liquid handler and then you can run them by ICPMS and digest them for proteins. Then you get basically maps of all the metals and all the proteins, and then you can put them back together again and um, have images of where the iron, zinc, cobalt, and copper in this case are within the cell uh, in terms of what proteins they bind to. And so then we get to the party that looks on these big peaks and you know, sure enough, this was ferritin. Um, zinc is incredibly complicated because it goes to so many different enzymes. And so you know, there's many different enzymes. These are a lot of um, um, ribosomal proteins on this one, but there can be carbon hydrases and alkyl phosphatases and so on. Um, and then we can combine this with use of mutants and knock out you know, specific enzymes like azurin in this case, and the copper peak will then disappear. Um, in the mutant, which is very satisfying. So a way to do metalloprotein discovery as well and high sort of high frequent analysis of of um, uh, of where the metals are within the cell. Right. Let's see. Um, and I also just wanted to mention um, that um, getting these samples is a big challenge too. So one thing that we've been collaborating on is um, working with engineers here at Woods Hole and at University of um, Texas Rio Grande Valley to make an, um, a robot called Clio that can get omics samples. Um, it's basically an underwater filtration robot that can go down to 6,000 meters in the ocean and collect these filters and then come up and send us a text message of where it is, and then the ship can go and 
grab it. And um, so that's an exciting project. We're actually going out to sea with it next month into the Pacific Ocean. Um, so, you know, just like we have robots in the lab, um, we're starting to develop robots for the sea. So um, I wanted to sort of end um, by asking some frequently asked questions about metaproteomics and go into a class demo as well, which I think I'm doing pretty good for time. Um, but these are three questions we often get asked about metaproteomics. And one, um, one that comes up frequently is, do transcripts and proteins correlate? Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of people in microbial ecology, in the environmental sciences, um, so there's a lot of RNA measurements out there, and, and people are, are really curious whether or not um, how to, it compares with, with proteins. And uh, in biomedical uh, communities, um, they've often found that correlations are frequently missing, right? And there's many, um, many instances of this, and, and, and people talk about it, and, and they've offered explanations such as epigenetics and PTMs um, as why you know, RNA and proteins may not correlate well. Um, and if you think about it, um, often these studies are multicellular organisms with multiple tissues and internal tissues that are, are multiple steps removed from the environment, right? Some or an organ inside uh, may not directly feel an environmental stimuli. Um, uh, whereas our organisms tend to be single cell organisms that are directly interacting with the environment. So, so they tend to have to directly respond to that stimuli. And I think that's a really important point. And um, because we often see correlations that work. And uh, I think that surprises a lot of our communities, uh, a lot of a lot of our proteomics colleagues. Um, here's an example of this in uh, a diatom. We see a, a bunch of phosphorus proteins responding in, in both protein and RNA space, and then a bunch of ribosomes that are, are, are also um, being sort of shut down when, when there's growth limitation and both protein and RNA space. So, so even though it's a big cluster in the middle, um, you'll notice that some proteins are really um, shining in, in, in correlating on, by going into these two quadrants. Um, so uh, why is that? And um, um, it turns out RNA and protein degradation are really key parts of this story. And I put up these pretty molecules of a ribonuclease with an inhibitor and, and a protease with also with an inhibitor. Um, um, and, and of course, um, the lifetime of each of these molecules um, serves different purposes, right? In, in RNA, they're trying to degrade rapidly because they don't want the information to stick around if it's outdated information. So, so RNases are fast and ubiquitous within the cell, whereas proteases, they don't really want to destroy an enzyme unless it's broken or its function is out of use or they need to recycle the amino acids or something. So um, proteases are, are not as ubiquitous and can be more targeted, right? Um, and so we wrote a simple, oops, sorry, um, a simple uh, box model for um, for RNA and protein uh, within a cell where there's some environmental signal and production of RNA and degradation of RNA, which is fast, production of protein and degradation of protein, which is slow. Um, and then wrote some very simple equations. And I, I um, wrote that up in MATLAB. And, um, and you actually see a um, point in time where RNA and protein correlate. Um, and so if you look at this part down here, you can see this dotted line is the one-to-one -one axis. And so if you wait, um, long enough for the protein to be made, but not before the RNA is decayed, um, it will intersect with that axis, right? And so, you know, you wait 12 hours or a day, um, you, you probably catch the signal of RNA and protein both being made at the same time. Um, however, um, this assumes a very low initial basal signal, so basically going from almost no signal to a major protein. Um, and so if you have a stress response like an alkaline phosphatase enzyme or a transporter you need to make when the nutrient is scarce, um, you, you have a huge upgrade. Um, in contrast, uh, a lot of metabolic proteins may have some residual um, uh, transcriptional level and inventory of protein, right? So in this case, we've assumed a 20% sort of basal always on signal. And what happens there is you, you basically get a cluster of data around the origin because uh, we often represent omic data in full change space. And so if you if you have an inventory of protein already and you make you know 20% more, your full change is actually quite small. And so even though you have the same exact pattern um, has on the left, it's just sort of shrunk into the axis, right? And and um, I think that's really what's happening in a lot of these data sets, right? Um, a lot of the environmental proteins start with a low basal signal and have large dynamic ranges in both protein and an RNA space. 
But then the metabolic proteins, sort of the maintenance systems, they may be going up and down, but in fold change space, that distance is very small because they're all sort of cycling around the axis here. And, and if you have a 20% change in, in a, a really abundant protein, it may be a huge investment of energy and resources, but it's only going to, you know, it's just going to move in this sort of cloud on the origin, right? So, um, so I think that's sort of a call to us to say, you know, um, it's the wrong expectation to expect RNA and DNA to uh, RNA and protein to correlate in full change space, you know, for abundant proteins. Like it's it's they're going to be, you know, you're not going to see a twofold change in a major abundant protein. It's it's going to be sort of in that cloud of the axis. But for environmentally responsive proteins, you're going to see them, and 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 that's what we see, right? So anyway, that's sort of an answer to that question. Um, and if you want more detail, um, it's in the paper, and the MATLAB model um, is up on my GitHub site too. So I'd love if someone wanted to play with it and do something different with it. Um, so uh, then I want to move to the second question. Um, I think a lot of people, especially biogeochemists um, or geochemists, are interested in some enzyme. Like, you know, where is the enzyme that transforms my organic molecule in the oceans, and who makes it, right? And and so. Um, we have this ocean protein portal, and um, in a moment we'll share a link and we'll do an in-class demo. And that allows you to interrogate a lot of the data that people have generated by making these ocean sections. And we'll, you'll all get a chance to do this in a moment. Um, and um, there's some papers here that refer to it. Um, and then another question that people ask is, well, you know, I know protein sequences uh, are not as specific as nucleic acid sequences because of, um, you know, um, codons that can, you know, um, multiple codons that can map to a, an amino acid. Um, so, you know, how specific are they really, right? The sort of this question. And, and the answer is actually um, surprisingly specific. Um, here's an example of every triptych peptide. So, you know, for bottom-up proteomics, um, all, all of our proteomics, basically, we digest with trypsin, so we have these smaller peptides. Um, if you look at every triptych peptide in these 50 genomes and you compare how many of them are identical across genomes, and then you take the percent of peptides that are identical, you can see that on this map. And an organism compared to itself, obviously, is 100% identical, so that's the white line in the middle. But then, um, and so then within a strain, Prochlorococcus or a species, um, sort of strain level differences, you know, you can see, you know, 50% or more shared peptides, right? But between different species, uh, you're down in the sub 10% range. Um, pro and sin are basically cousins with each other. Um, and, and so in most cases, you know, you're sort of bottoming out um, in like single digit percent shared peptides between different species. Uh, and I think that surprises a lot of people. And if you go to something like E. coli, you're basically gonna get nothing, right? Um, and that, this is the kind of approach we used for um, those targeted studies where we basically made a list of peptides that we were targeting and we used this program called Metatrip that you're all gonna use in a moment and basically went through and said, okay, you know, these peptides map to metrospina but not to nitrospira and so on um, using um, this. And Metatrip is basically um, a program that, that runs, um, runs uh, has about 300 curated microbial genomes that have been triptych digested in a database that you can then access in real time through this web portal. Um, and uh, we actually made an instance of it for COVID because we realized, you know, people are trying to design COVID um, targeted proteomic assays too and, and wondering how unique they were. And so we compared, you know, coronavirus um, with the flu, for example, and there's no shared peptides um, as we would expect, but I think, you know, people may not realize. Um, so, I think we're ready to start our demo. Um, let's see, how are we doing? Yes, looks like Daniel sent the tiny URL with the um, a worksheet, and yeah. so I also great. just pasted another URL because I think your dot uh, org URL was broken. At least it didn't oh. work on my end. So I think okay. about that, uh, I'll correct me if I'm wrong, but like that protein portal dot uh, dot edu, that one worked. Oh, okay. Did I get it wrong? Well, I don't know. At least I got an error when I tried okay. to dot org. I might have, I might have, uh, anyway, thank you for fixing that. And so let's see, did I stop sharing? I did. So I think the idea here is I've made a worksheet. Let me see if I can find the worksheet. Or if you have it handy, Daniel, let's see, you can share it. 
Oh, it's in the chat. Let me go. Great, here we go. So um, basically the idea, I, I made this um, today to have you have a quick way to get into this, but also this background reading um, in the future. So the idea is you can basically just jump to the red text and try things out. And if you need more information, you can go down below. But basically, I you know I want people to sort of hit um, these uh, um, try these various tools out. And um, and as you're going along, um, let's put what you're seeing in the chat, like what protein you picked, um, and uh, you know um, some of these questions that may be in here. Just so, or if you have questions too, you can talk about things too. Meg, can, can I ask you something? Maybe you yeah. can showcase that on the when you share the screen. So we are very interested in proteases. Um, oh yeah, in in Great. the open ocean. So like, I just typed in trypsin. Um, is there a way to like also get like some some sort of like abundance information? So is that a, an abundant protein? Yeah. So um, let's type in proteases. Or peptidase. Um, and so this column here, spectral count, is basically um, the abundance of that protein. It's a summed quantity, so and it's set up to give you the most abundant one first. And um, um, currently, the search is using protein names, so it's text-based searches into the product name or the keg descriptions. Um, you can do a sequence-based search as well. Um, but that will look for, and you can paste in a sequence, but that currently maps to exact triptych peptides within the environmental data. And so if you're using model organism data or, you know, an E. coli or something, it probably won't map to many things. Um, but version two, which we're getting ready to launch, or version 1.5, um, will have a diamond interface, which will then re return real-time um, um, alignment sequences and, and DNA sequences. But yeah, so so for example, let's click on this view section. Um, and you can see this actually gives you an, a very quick visualization of uh, where this enzyme is in the ocean. And we can look and see whose it is. And this is a perchlorococcus one. So that makes sense. It's in the upper water column in the photic zone. Um, looks like it's particularly um, here around station eight. Um, and it, you know, if you slide this over, you can see in the map where this data comes from. It's highlighted there. That's super cool. We we should have something like that for metabolites too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, let's see, how are people doing? Has anyone found a protein and made an interesting section? So I actually have a question. So yeah. my protein that I chose is uh, Rubisco. So Rubisco is a really abundant protein, right? So I yes. went and typed it in and actually there are not so many entries. So I was a bit surprised. Um, so is there like a way like that you can see how relevant is your protein? Yeah. So one of the reasons that that is happening is that, um, um, well, there's probably two reasons. One, the data sets that are in here are primarily sort of prokaryotic data sets. So it's, you can see this is hitting to lots of, um, there's lots of prochlorococcus and, and some methanosarcina. Um, a lot of the eukaryotic organisms, um, uh, here's one a eukaryote, but but they're they're often in the larger size fraction, and there's not as many eukaryotic data sets in into the protein portal yet. Uh, another thing may just be that um, the annotation may not say Rubisco; it may be the full name of the enzyme, and so you know you may have to type in oxygenase um, or some other version of that. Right? You can see that that worked here um, for rib ribulose one five bisphosphate, et cetera, the full name. Um, yeah, and uh, we can increase the number of entries. Yeah, there's an Osteococcus one. But I think, yeah, eukaryotic data, there's going to be a whole bunch more eukaryotic data coming into the into the system in the, in the coming year or so. Yeah, I was mainly wondering because also like cyanobacteria, like which are prokaryotes, also use like a lot of proboscope clusters. So I would have expected, like I'm not familiar with 
like ocean samples, but I kind of would have, like I'm most curious if you see yeah, yeah. an ocean samples as well. Yeah, we can, um, here we can show you one, one of those then. So here's Prochlorococcus and these are both Rubisco, that's a transcriptional regulator, but you can see that's in the upper water column for Prochlorococcus. And mm -hmm. here's another Rubisco transcriptional regulator. I wonder what it's annotated has in Prochlorococcus. Oh, here's a large subunit. Yeah. Um, but this one doesn't have a, this one is a surface section, so it doesn't have a, um, doesn't have a section capability. But it's definitely in there. I've seen it in other contexts. I think it's mostly trying to figure out the search terms to, to pull it up. But it's a cool tool. Thanks a lot. Sure, <laughs> sure. Really what's the what's the most abundant protein in your data set? Oh, um, I think it is the nitride oxide reductase. Um, it's like an oxide reductase. That actually is often misannotated in, in genomes. But there it is, the NXR A and B. Look and see the spectral counts. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little ridiculous, right? That looks like the paper, you know, the stuff in the paper I showed, right? Um, and uh, yeah, that one really dominates. But there's, you know, you can find other ones in there, like ammonia monooxygenase. So what do you say? Like because you you find these um, uh, nitrogen. Um, I forgot the exact term of like the two proteins that you found, like the R, I, and B and R, and A. So yes. what you say? So like it seemed to be like mostly it's like lower, like in the not in the upper. It's like uh, when you go deeper in the sea levels. So would you say like nitrogen in general is like in the lower levels is like the most important energy and like resources? Yeah. So you know what, what we really see is there's this transition between. Um, photosynthetic organisms that are yeah. using sunlight and rubisco and then and then as you go down deeper then you have organisms that are then using the sinking decaying photosynthetic organisms and degrading it with proteases to amino acids and then amino acids to ammonia and then ammonia to nitrite and 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 then that's so ammonia monooxygenase and nitrite oxide reductase they're, they're really kicking in to try and gain energy from all those um basically organic matter degradation products um so yeah you know this is another you know a great example of this, the ecosystem switching from phototrophy to chemolithotrophy in this case. Great. Now, how are people doing? Should we move on to the um, yeah questions? The version? Okay. Question? Uh, yeah. So I think before we're gonna move on to that, um, I gotta stop the recording. And then yeah, for the, to those of you who are gonna take off, thanks a lot for for stopping by. And yeah, especially thanks to Mac again for this fascinating uh, lecture and, and hands-on. So it's really cool. All right. See you next time.